Come with me. We are about to embark upon a treasure hunt. Buried treasure, secret societies, magic, mystery. The words clutch at the imagination, ringing down through the centuries with the sound of a brazen bell. The story which we have to tell includes all these and more. And we shall begin with an old and daunting image. The Devil. We shall find that in this story, nothing is ever as simple as it seems. The devil will prove to be more than a religious idea, more than just a frightening force for evil. In our story, the devil will prove to be a pointer in unexpected directions. Before we end our investigation, he will lead us to the glint of gold and the scent of mystery. And more, we shall find that even today, he has something startling to show us. The devil will be our guide into one of the most amazing mysteries of our time. But we shall begin in the Middle Ages, when for Christians there was no doubting the power and reality of the forces of the evil. The devil stalked the earth and was to be fought with all the means mankind could find. Faith, fire and the sword were the weapons which would overcome the heretic and the unbeliever. The Crusades epitomised this struggle, and most people imagine them being fought out in the desert wastes of the Holy Land. Richard the Lionheart against Saladin, armoured knights against Saracen infidel. But the Holy Land was only one corner of a great triangle of warfare. To the north, pagan hordes lay across the Baltic Sea. And in fact, the Pope had decided that holding back those northern infidel was as valid as the battle for Jerusalem. Far off to the southwest lay the other boundary of the Christian lands, the Pyrenees, and beyond them lay the threatening might of the Moors. This great triangle marking the outposts of Christendom has at its limits the three places which will figure most significantly in our story. Jerusalem in the Holy Land marks the eastern point. In France, to the west, the once mighty Visigothic citadel of Ayreda now shrunk to a tiny mountaintop village, Rennes-le-Chateau, and to the north, Bornholm, a Danish island in the Baltic Sea. In the early Middle Ages, the time of the Crusades, Bornholm already had a long history. These traces of the island's long past reach back to a culture which flourished before the advent of Christianity. Then there was an older, now long forgotten religion, which for us is shrouded in mystery, but upon which our researches may shed a faint light. Scattered over the island were once more than a thousand megaliths, standing stones whose meaning and purpose now can only be guessed at. Today, only some 250 or so remain. 2,000 and more years ago, these stones were raised with great care and labor and for a purpose. Why? What is so precious about this place? Could it perhaps have been a holy island, sacred to our ancestors?
From the year 1200 onwards, frequent crusading fleets sailed from Lübeck, organized by the Danish king Valdemar II. And for those fleets, Bornholm was admirably placed as a strategic supply base. This then was the situation where one of the most mysterious and renowned organizations of the Middle Ages was active throughout Europe and the Middle East, the Knights Templar, a proud order of warrior monks. And this too was the time when these churches of Bornholm were built. The 15 medieval churches of Bornholm are not like others in Denmark. For historians, they are an enigma. Four of them are round, and their construction echoes that of others built in distant lands and known to be associated with the Knights Templar. The churches seem to be hinting that they were here, even though the historical record bears no trace of a Templar presence. For instance, this church at Oesterlas shows an outstanding resemblance to numerous Templar structures known as Capelli Militium. Each Templar commandery included such a round structure. Often it is thought the scene of initiation for new knights joining the order. But it is not only the physical appearance of the churches which makes us suspect a Templar presence. There are also the facts of history. For certainly there was present around the Baltic, in Estonia and Lithuania, for example, an order of knights who are remembered as the Knights of the Sword. The Knights of the Sword share the Templars' rule and seem very like what one might call a northern establishment of the Templars, closely engaged in the Crusades on the Baltic's eastern shore. Before we end our investigation, we shall find that the churches of Bornholm conceal a truly extraordinary secret. Only one thing can be pointed out at this moment, the geometry of their construction. They are round, and beside each one is a square tower. Once, there was a powerful symbolic significance in such geometric configurations. The symbolism of the circle and the square carried immense import. Later, we shall see that the Templars' activities were not necessarily confined to battle. But we have a long pathway to follow before we understand the significance of these amazing structures. But since the Templars are so strong a thread in the early stages of our hunt, we should learn a little more of their story. In 1099, Jerusalem had at long last been recaptured from the Saracen unbelievers. In the years that followed, the world seethed with Crusader activity. In 1118, so we are told, nine French knights presented themselves to the King of Jerusalem. They wished, they said, to devote themselves to protecting the highways of the Holy Land, to ensure the safety of the pilgrims who journeyed in such numbers to see the places where the Saviour lived on earth. And thus, the Knights Templar ride onto the pages of history. And as the years passed, the order expanded with commanderies all over Europe, and they became immensely wealthy. More mystery surrounds their ending in 1307. No one denied that throughout the two centuries of their existence, the Templars fought and died valiantly for Christ and in the name of the Church. And yet, they ended in the flames amid accusations of heresy. They denied Christ and trampled on the cross, or so said their accusers. There's another mystery which surrounds their immense wealth. What became of the Templars' treasury when the order was suppressed at the beginning of the 14th century? This is a question we must examine a little more closely. 
By the end of the 1200s, the Holy Land had long been lost, and the Templars were dreaming of establishing an autonomous state of their own, here in the Languedoc. For King Philippe le Bel of France, they posed a threat and offered a temptation. They were established all over his kingdom and he had no control over them. They obeyed no king. But more than this, Philippe owed them money. The Templars, he decided, were to be destroyed. He issued sealed orders to all the seneschals throughout his kingdom. They were to be opened and acted upon simultaneously everywhere on the night of the 12th of October, 1307. The seneschals were ordered to arrest all Templars on their lands at dawn on Friday the 13th of October. The knights fell into the trap. The threat was removed. But the king had hoped for more than this. He had hoped to lay hands on their huge treasury, which he had expected to find in their headquarters in Paris. But no treasure was ever found, either there or in any of the other commanderies, a mystery which remains unsolved to this day. This man, the French priest Berger Saunière, may hold the key to the enigma. Here, then, we are in the foothills of the French Pyrenees, some 40 minutes drive due south of the ancient city of Carcassonne. This is the village of Montazel. In this house, on the 11th of April, 1852, Berger Saunière was born, the bright, intelligent son of a peasant family. For such a gifted young man, there was little hope for advancement in this impoverished community. The church was one sure way of escape. Saunière became a priest, and eventually, in 1885, at the age of 33, he came home. He was appointed curé of the tiny hamlet of Rennes-le-Chateau, across the valley from his birthplace. He was back in the haunts of his childhood. Life in this rural peasant backwater was hard, for the priest as well as for his flock. Like them, he was all but penniless. Then, in 1891, after five years of penury, something happened. Sunier's church was in a ruinous state of decay. Borrowing a small sum from the village funds, he set about the most essential repairs. The altar stone was cracked and crumbling. When Saunière had it removed, one of its two supporting pillars proved to be hollow. Now it stands where Saunière put it, in a little garden crowned by a statue of the Virgin. For within this hollow stone, it seems, was the key to a treasure. And for the remaining quarter century of his life, Saunière spent money as if there were no limit to his resources. So what was inside the pillar? Documents, apparently. Parchments. Superficially, they seem innocent enough. Passages from the Gospels in Latin, easily read by a Catholic priest such as Saunier, but concealed in the Gospel texts are secret messages. If you look closely, you can see that some of the letters are raised above the line of writing, and these raised letters spell out a message, and this message is not in Latin, it is in French. A Dagobert de Roy et à Zion et ce trésor et il est la mort. This treasure belongs to Dagobert II, king, and to Zion, and he is there dead. Here is our first clue. Zion is Jerusalem, one of the points of our triangle. 
What links can there be between the French village and the Holy City? And could there be a link with treasure? Well, Jerusalem did indeed possess a treasure. The treasure of Solomon's temple, stolen by the Roman legions of the Emperor Titus when he sacked the city in 70 AD. It was brought to Rome. And then, three and a half centuries later, Rome itself was pillaged by the barbarian Visigoths, and the temple treasure became part of their booty, which they held in their stronghold at Carcassonne. A mere century later, Carcassonne itself was under threat, and the trail of Jerusalem's treasure appears to end. But. A mere 40 kilometres to the south of Carcassonne was another Visigoth stronghold, just as mighty. Its name was Ireda. Perhaps the treasure of the temple was taken there for safety when Carcassonne was threatened. A fascinating possibility for the mighty stronghold of Ireda, with its 40,000 inhabitants, is now shrunk to the tiny hilltop village of Rennes-le-Château, Saunier's village. Have we found one possibility for the source of the priest's wealth? Could it have been the treasure of Solomon's temple? Perhaps. But the secret message spoke not only of Jerusalem. This treasure belongs to Zion and to Dagobert II, king. Now, who was this Dagobert? And did he have a treasure? And is he in some way associated with Rennes le Chateau? Again, the answer is yes. He was Saint Dagobert, king of the Merovingian Franks, and he married Giselle, niece of the emperor of the Visigoths. When Dagobert was assassinated in 679 AD, his infant son Sigebert, we are told, was taken to safety at the family home of his mother Giselle. And that home was Ireda Rennes le Chateau. This stone is said to depict the rescue of the young siege bear being carried to safety by a mounted knight. It was discovered by Saunier as he continued his restoration of the village church. So Rennes le Chateau is linked with a treasure, which in turn links with Jerusalem and King Dagobert. What next? Well, when Saunier first found his treasure, whatever it was, he began to spend enormous sums of money. He built a handsome house, the Villa Betania. Beside it, he planted shade trees and laid out a garden. And then, on the very edge of the mountain, this extraordinary building to house his library. This he called La Tour Magdala, the Magdala Tower. Both names closely associated with the patron saint of the village to whom Sonia's church is dedicated. Mary Magdalini, Mary of Magdala, the reformed harlot who anointed Christ's feet at the house of Lazarus in Bethany. And good parish priest that he was, he shared his newfound wealth with open-handed generosity. He built this water tower so that his villagers might have the luxury of piped water. And a colossal expense, he had the long dirt track down to the valley remade into a good modern road. But his most munificent gesture was reserved for the scene of his original discovery. At his own expense, he completely restored and redecorated the little village church. And in keeping with his own flamboyant nature, it became an amazing and colourful palace of images. And some of those details are unexpected, even shocking. 
Who, coming through a church door, would expect to be greeted by this? Not just a devil. This is Asmodeus, legendary guardian of Solomon's treasure. Rex Mundi, king and lord of the earth. Is Sonia trying to tell us something? The church is filled with clues, hints, secret messages. But first, there are other things to consider. For Saunier not only left clues, he seems to have taken just as much pains to conceal them. He carefully removed the inscription which had been carved onto this tombstone, which once marked the grave of an 18th century great lady of Rennes-le-Chateau, the Dame de Blanchefort. And now, suddenly, if faintly, the Templars have reappeared in the story. For the Dame de Blanchefort was the last descendant of Bertrand de Blanchefort, fourth Grand Master of the Knights Templar. The Grand Master who built, it is said, a watchtower on that mountain across the valley, on the crest which still bears the family name, Blanchefort. To the south, across the plain, there is a tall and noticeable mountain peak. It is the Peak of Bezu. And here too, we are told, Bertrand placed a Templar commandery. The Templars' order came to an end when King Philippe Seneschals moved against them in 1307. All the commanderies were taken by surprise. All fell to the king's hand, but not this one. Bezu lay beyond the king's grasp. Did the Bezu Templars escape because they were warned? And if so, by whom? A clue lies in the name of the commander of this place. He was the Seigneur de Gaulle. And the Pope, the king's accomplice in the plot, who on his election took the name of Clement V, was Bertrand de Gaulle. Could it have been that de Gaulle family feeling led the Pope to warn a relative? Or could there have been something more? For our circle has closed. Bertrand de Gaulle's mother was Ida de Blanchefort. Family secrets, papal secrets. No matter which line we follow, always we are led back here to Rennes le Chateau. But for now, there is one question which nags at the mind. This is the gravestone of the last of the Blanchefort family. Once there was an inscription on it. Why did Saunier take such pains to prevent us seeing it? 